Please, they're not all sweet. Oh. All right, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. It's a budget workshop, so this is not a formal meeting. So you can interject at any time with your thoughts and opinions. But let's go ahead and call the meeting to order and we'll start with our pledges. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which is the one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <laughs> my arms are lined out. I've gotten to where sometimes I have my glasses and a magnifying glass. Isn't that bad? Don't laugh, you're going to get there. An eye doctor appointment <laughs> coming up. All right, so city manager, you want to get us started? So tonight's uh, budget workshop is about revenue. Um, I've given council a plethora of information in regards to the different parts of the revenue sources and background information and, <laughs> and anything and everything. And there's probably 10 times more. Um, but I summarized some of the, the major things um, really for the public. But I wanted to go over a, a key thing that I had given out to the council. Um, the first one being our tax rates. I provided a list of all of our tax rates from 2019 um, to current to give you an idea of what we had for each year compared to the no new revenue tax rate. Um, so the no new revenue is the new term that the state uses as effect. So that's what the effective tax rate is. That is the rate that it's established that allows you to collect the same amount as you would have those year before. So that's kind of your baseline for any tax rate. And from there, you can obviously go up, you can go down. Um, there's different directions that city can take for that. And then what we adopted. I know that Darren had put together a little worksheet that he wanted to give out to his residents um, in regards to the tax rate. But the key to the tax rate that I really want everyone to understand when we discuss it is there's an MO, which is maintenance and operating. That's the day-to-day -day functions. And then the INS rate, which is our interest in sinking, that is specific to our debt. So the INS rate is actually set first. The INS rate is set to collect what we need for the year. So we don't just pick a number and bring in whatever we want for INS. It's specifically what we have for the debt for the year. So for fiscal year 23-24, our Total debt is $390,491. But interest in sinking only has to collect $147,909. So that's the tax, the INS rate, what we have to collect to pay the general funds portion of the debt. The remaining portion of that debt actually comes out of the water department. And that would be $242,582. And so when we set the INS rate, after we know what our base appraised values are, that tells us one, our effective, out of that effective, what do we have to collect for INS? Whatever's left over is actual maintenance and operating. And that's what we actually budget to run the general fund. That information is not enough. This is just some supportive information to explain how we get to the next part of, of that. Okay. So lots of numbers have to be plugged in to know which direction we wanna go. The other thing that was provided to council um, was our preliminary. So the preliminary report for the appraised values came in at $516,402,898. There are over 3,000 protests. So mm -hmm. that number I can kind of tell you right now will change significantly. Um, I don't think it will change below 400, 000, or 400 million, but it will still change. When is, the, okay. <laughs> when is the deadline for that? So the protests, you had to protest by June 5th. So now they're just knocking our, our scheduling, all of the protest hearings and going through all of the, I guess the people's um, protests and what the documentation they provided. 
Um, I know with Garen being on the CAD, he'll get to be part of some of those hearings, I believe. Oh, no, no that's the arm. Group. Okay. That's yeah, that's the arm. Um, good to know. But so we it's basically have to take a while. Work. So then we get an update at one at the so ideally the state requires that the appraisal district have this completed by July 25th, 26th, 25th or 6th. And then we have to have the certified tax rule. If for any reason the CAD is unable to provide the certified values, they have to provide notice because these are all state statutes. Um, I've never been in Alpine in when I worked at the county and when I worked at the city that they ever missed that deadline. They've always had it, whether it was last minute, you know, midnight, they always had it prepared by that deadline. Wow. The question I was going to ask real quick, but uh, was there's number of counts 4,062. When we hear there's 3,000 protests, that I wonder for all Brewster County or just city of Alpine? That would be all Brewster County. I was like, wow, is that 75% of people? But. <laughs> That, that would be everyone um, who's filed. And it's a little, I believe, over a little over 3,000. I didn't get an exact. Um, but so for the next basically two months, they will have to, or month and a half left, they'll have to go through all those protests, adjust accounts that meet the protest requirements or not, and then we'll get another one. I know last year, Denise, about mm, second week of July, sent me out another preliminary just so I had numbers to start trying to, to figure out our tax rate. Um, so it's important to know the appraised values really do set the path for our tax rate. And so once we know that, we have a better understanding of where we stand and a better understanding of what our effective tax rate. So effective is the base, that's where we start. So after all of these 3,000 people have been seen, or thought to, that money, that, that the figure will go down. Most likely, yes. Most likely. Yeah. It won't go up. <laughs> so I have a number of questions. One, what was our appraised value, taxable appraised value last year? Um, last year was about 1.5. Do you have that one of the documents you sent us? I have it in. I have. Something. I didn't see it. No, okay. it wasn't in one that I sent you. I was just wondering if, which one I needed to no. download. <laughs> We have eight eight files that Megan sent us. Right. <laughs> yeah. They seem to be labeled pretty well. Yeah. Last year's appraised certified was four hundred and thirty seven million one hundred and seventeen thousand six hundred three. Okay, so basically four hundred and thirty seven million. So the delta this year is there is eighty million dollars more in net taxable. Uh, assets for the city. Okay, so uh, the next question I have then is uh, we had a survey and I gave you option five <laughs> and you said option five is the same as option one. Can you please walk through because uh, my, my five was leave the tax rate the same, okay, not, not affect the tax rate, just leave um, what percentage we do for our dollar value same and out of that we're getting revenue out of it in essence an additional 80 million dollars because that's the appraised value of them so kind of walk through dick and janice a little bit about what the process is in terms of our options and what our limitations are so because state law did change um if we were to use the exact same tax rate we may have to go out for both okay so and, and so help me understand where is that threshold um, so it really is all dependent on the, uh, the no new revenue, the effect. So it's understanding the base rate. Um, so the more the appraised values, the lower the effective, um, because you're trying to bring in the exact same amount of money as you did the year before. So that With is no new revenue. One. That's not my option five. No. That is, okay. 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 So option one is no new revenue right. so you take your appraised value in this case 80 million dollars more you go through the math come out with an effective tax rate that brings in the same amount of revenue. so it would be lower than the current tax year's rate. effective tax rate right because we have more money Understood. that's so the base you, yes from which then all future decisions get yes. made and walk through those limits so the city has multiple options at this point one, we can raise it up to 3.5%. Our 
I take three to be comfortable that you know we don't have to go out for a vote. Um, we can go out for a vote if we raise it over that limit, which means we have to take it to the public. We can do the one time de minutes, um, which means the rate that is considered the de minutes will automatically bring 500,000 more in. It's kind of a one and done. It's 500,000 extra in property taxes. That rate is a little bit high. Oh. Um, and then we have the last option of using incremental um, tax rate. So because we're a population under 30,000, we've been kind of banking our increases, which would allow us to do an incremental, which means whatever we haven't raised in the period of three years, we could utilize that to raise the taxes one time. So every year we went with the effective, that little percentage that we could have raised it, we kind of, I don't want to say banked, but it's been put to the side. So we could take the 3%, the 3%, the 1%, and ideally raise it 7%. Wow. But um, there are a lot of legal questions. I would have to make sure that we don't have to go out for voter approval because I don't believe we do. But we have, I, I want to verify before I do anything because everything I read says, no, you don't have to. But then there's always that one little sentence that says, if. Um, so we have those options with our taxes. So I, I just kind of went through a little bit of the math, okay? Uh, if we, because uh, 3%, okay, on an additional $80 million doesn't buy you much, okay? Uh, yeah, so that doesn't seem to make sense. And 500,000, here is the max you can go for. And part of the discussions I've had in Ward 5 has been about leave the tax rate the same. Regardless of what we do, we have a lot of work to do to talk with all of our residents about what's going on. Okay. Because just to say go 3% tax rate and buy steadily, I all we do is irritate people. That's why I've been saying leave the tax rate the same. Okay. And that, as you continue to increase property values, you get a net gain out of that, which is close to three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Except for if the percentage of the increase from the effective to our current tax rate. Understand that. Then understand. we'd have to go. I understand, but we have work to do, in my opinion, regardless of what we do, because just putting three percent in, forget it. In my opinion, that is a worthless effort because one, we don't get revenue, we don't have the right discussion and we don't get the impact of the increased tax revenue. So now let me ask, what is there any, if there's new, uh, there's the appreciable value, and then there is new construction. Are there, is there any delineation between what the city can do with new construction, i.e. does it allow us to go up on our effective tax rate as a result of new assets? So basically, they, they don't give a rats. You could double your tax base going from 480000 to a million bucks. You're not allowed to collect any more money on that new property. It's all taxed the same. The only thing is, is how we report it. We right. report basically, you know, what we're bringing in and yeah. what from that is coming from new property. Okay, so in my opinion, regardless of what we choose, we have some work to do to educate uh, 6,000 people now by about what's going on. First, they're pissed off because the values went up so much, basically 20%. That's really what's happened across the board. You can say minimum 20%. Okay? But if we went from, if we went up 80 million over 437, yeah, that's pretty close to 20%. So your total new taxable value yeah. um, in the preliminary is. Two million eight hundred fifty-two thousand eight hundred. Yes. Yep. yep. <laughs> so we have some work to do, regardless. And I think we as council need to talk about a strategy and really talk to residents about what that looks like, so they really understand. One is property values are going up. Okay, people are realizing value out of that. As we talked a couple weeks ago. There's some property in the tax rolls that are unbelievably low, mm -hmm. have never caught up. People will catch up with that when they sell the property. 
flip side of that is, uh, you know, so people can plan, you know, you'd like to be able to have the tax rate and when's the right time to go collect that. So in my mind, we don't have a discussion. Um, and that's part of tonight. Um, I know that Darren Nance did bring it, you know, what exemptions does, this, does the city provide? So a lot of cities have multiple types of exemptions. The only exemption that we have under the city is, is the homestead. We don't offer any other age. exemptions. Well, age, but the, the age and veteran are, yeah. are regulated with the state. Oh, okay. gotcha. um, so I don't really get points there. Mm -hmm. um, but the homestead, because um, I know that Darren's been looking at, especially um, how to do economic development and things to bring in. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. But looking at, you know, the 380s, the 312s, these are exemption yeah. programs that help businesses. So we, we currently offer nothing. It's just the homes. So in this budget, what is that? Is that an ordinance? How do we do that if we wanted to offer exemptions for economic development? You would What's definitely want to put a policy and procedures in place because you don't want to just say, well, here, here's $2,000. Good luck. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> so we would want to attach that to to the budget. What what would we want to do? I don't think right now you would be able to attach it to a budget um, without doing a lot of further understanding of what all it entails. Do we have to have a former ordinance? Do we have to have it through our charter? Um, I was trying to find up specifically, Darren had brought up, you know, the charter allows for certain things. Does it allow for C us to do that? Um, not every city has that in the ability to do it. It's to provide loans and grants and that kind of thing. Um, and then it's fully understanding the impact of a 380 and how does it get monitored? How do we verify? It's that procedural side. It's not just handing the money and saying, okay, I've given you the money and now I'm going to see you do A, B, and C. So we would need another employee basically to manage that. Mm -hmm. How would we do it procedural or administratively? You would definitely want to, to have someone help with that because then you get into like your your private public partnerships you know those are there are beneficial but i've seen the, the the downside of them especially in towns that don't have someone dedicated to manage them because then the private side has the upper hand you want to make sure that the public side is covered and that we have someone who's keeping up with all the regulations keeping up with the contractual making sure everything is being done and, and we don't have that in outcome when um, when the city had a chamber of commerce, was that partially financed through the city? Funded through the city? Mm, kind of, sort of, no. <laughs> so I say that the, the, the chamber ran independently from the city. The city contracted with the chamber to run the visitor center. So we paid the chamber to manage the visitor center. And so that kind of got convoluted with their books and how things were being done. Um, but we didn't actually sponsor the chamber. But revenue from the city did go in towards <laughs> economic development in that regard. Tourism. Sort of. So the city paid the chamber $80,000 a year, or the equivalent of, okay, gave them the, the visitor center and the funding to go work that. Okay, that contract was terminated when the executive director of the chamber started embezzling some money. And she got terminated. City Council said, pull on that house. So. so they lost the building. They lost kind of their storefront. Yep. And they just slowly fizzled out. Yep. One. Yeah. What were you going to say, Darren? One last question on this, too, would be um, with the governor calling a special session on, and they haven't figured out if they're going to do all that, when does that come to conclusion? Can we know how that affects certified values? Um, I don't know how long this first special session will last. Um, this is the first. Um, I know in the prior legislative sessions, they've actually called two and three special sessions to go through them all. Um, so basically, when I look at legislation, I look at the September 1st deadline, because that's when a lot of things will go into effect, because that corresponds with the state's fiscal. Um, the other big date to look at is January 1st. So as they're going through this legislation, um, the special session, um, it's really just paying attention to how the, the bills are worded to when they take effect. 
There are several bills that take effect based on the vote. So if they get a two thirds majority, they become effective immediately. Mm -hmm. So as far as all these big property tax ones that are really up for debate this session, they may get through this session and some will pass, some will fail, or they may get pushed into a second session. It's really up to the governor. That, that's why they put it on the, the front burner too, so they can resolve the values of tax. So that could affect us. That could affect us, yes. Hmm. I mean, the big one that would definitely affect us um, is the homestead, 70 to 100,000. Um, there's a lot that will affect the schools. Um, which affects our community as a whole. But even if the homestead went up, given the increase in asset values of almost 20%, that would be de minimis on effective tax rate. It should be, yes. For us, they do it. There'd be a lot of homestead people who would be happy as the primary property, but in terms of impact in the city of Alpha, it's going to be almost it. In fact, it just reduces potential amount that goes up, but that's not going to be usual. Got all that? That makes sense? So, so, so essentially, what, what's the homestead values right now? I don't recall and I should. You have it in the document? I got homestead. My problem is I'm too old. I'm so a veteran. It's 70000 right now. Okay. So, so let's assume right it goes now. up to 100000 says it's uh, $30,000. If you kind of walk your way through all that, uh, the number of, of properties, kind of $80 million, that's not going to be much. You may, you may lose 10 million. I'll say you lose 10 million. That is totally optimistic. The other side of the homestead that I'm hoping will kind of help the city manage, you know, is STRs that are homestead in that aren't actually homestead. Those should be short -term yeah. Yeah, short term rentals. They, they lose the homestead. If you have a if you have a property so that you do not live in and you're it's a business, you get a homestead. I thought that was current. Because I know I couldn't homestead Magnolia. You just gotta go find all the people who are so it's working with the cat on our side. Telling us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's working with the cat on our side and giving them, hey, these are all the ones who've registered as short-term rentals. Yeah. Because it's easy to understand this is a short-term rental and they're just renting out a room or are they renting out the full house? So yeah. renting out the full house, you've got a higher chance of the home city. Right. Like my, my mom, I own her house. She had to get the homestead. Since I own it, I don't get the homestead. Right. I get the homestead on my property. Mm -hmm. And I, I did bring that up in the council meetings about one of the legislative uh, things that passed was that the chief appraiser officer will now have to come up with a mechanism to verify the homestead every uh, one of the five. So what you're saying is you, if you, you own multiple properties, you can only homestead. Right. That's correct. The yeah. one gets your residence. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But then if it were under her name, she could lose benefits. Oh, if it was on her name, she could she could homestead. It's not a problem. She could homestead it. But wouldn't she lose benefits? So yeah. she wouldn't. Okay, she'll get your social security. She's social security. She still gets all that stuff. Well, but if it were like Medicaid and stuff. Well, like she's that, not why she doesn't get any of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, yeah. but I'm saying, you yeah. know, just population wise, you know, you yeah. lose. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, okay. So we, one of the actions in my view, we need a. Tax property tax. So yeah, so this is a key document. We everything. need a what? I didn't hear you. We need a property tax strategy. Mm -hmm. One, educate residents. Two, what does it mean from a council standpoint and from a budget perspective about going forward? Okay. Right now, people are so up in arms about property values that they're attacking on that. In my mind, we ought to let that settle out and then decide what our game plan and strategy is going to be. You know, in my opinion, you don't want to poke people in the eyes and say, we're going to, regardless of what comes out, we're going to jack it up 3%, because that doesn't buy you much. Uh, it really is, what's our plan and how does all that work from an overall strategy for the broader budget and the implications? And one thing that the, the public and the council both need to know, we have to actually approve the budget before we can even approve the tax rate. Yeah. Right. So the budget has that to helps. be in place no matter what. We have to have a strategy for both. So yeah. 
after getting the, the certified appraised certified tax roll, that's when the tax discussions really start because we don't really have a base. We have an estimate. Right. And then based off of, you know, the protests and you've heard a lot of the public, you know, upset, these numbers could change. And so we definitely want to wait till we have the exact so before we start even really strategizing. So but that was another big piece of information. Yeah. Just back to the authority to levy taxes, 5.4 of the charter says the city may levy tax for any type and amount not permitted by laws and constitution, state tax or other provisions of the charter. That's it. So I would think we'd have flexibility. We have flexibility, but we can't uh, go against the state. No, I understand that. I, I got on that as since you can't go against the state. But going back to the point about uh, whether or not we use it from an economic development standpoint, or, uh, increase exemptions for what we think are the right things that would be good for the city. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. We can put the 380s, the 312s. That's, we can, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. some kind of credit for zero scaping. Or would that come that out of the water and utilities. utilities? Yeah, I think that would be wise. We need to work that. Yes, we some, do. We're talking about it. Is there some research we ought to be doing now about what that would look like if we were to consider that? To consider the zero scaping or the what? Yeah. Well, two conversations. Two conversations. <laughs> Certainly one of those. But, well, either one. One in terms of if we're going to do the 380s, 312s, or whatever. Okay and or if we wanted to give credits for zero escape or whatever. So after uh, Darren mentioned it, I went ahead. There is a lot of state regulations on 380s. Okay. Um, so I pulled the state code to look at um, where we fall. Um, technically, all cities can fall under a 380, but there's always that except. Can you or, explain what 380 means so for those who don't know? So are tax. I want to say abatement except there are tax exceptions for businesses specifically to to improve their business. Right. I know Darren had focused on utilizing them to include sorry to improve the overall the the facade. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. The facade. Of the the facade. So they would basically get a tax uh, credit or an incentive that would allow them to make improvements to the structure of the building. So this is where it tied back when we started talking about the planning and zoning. And one of the things that they've been working on is like the historical district. And, you know, I, if I own a building down, you know, middle of downtown, I'm going to paint it purple with yellow polka dots because, you know, Alpine's blue and gold, or maybe blue and purple oh and gold, God. um, <laughs> that may, you know, not be what the city really wants our downtown to look like. And so it was to have the planning and zoning develop a historical district that tied back to an ordinance that tied back to how we want the buildings to move forward with. If you're gonna remodel, you have to meet certain criteria. I thought that was already in there. No. Um, they had to be a certain color, they had to be a store. store. What can we don't have a historic district? Working on it though. Zoning and planning is really working on it. So I know what's his name. Tara worked on that for years you now. No, but the other guy, Tom. Well, we, he actually did a lot of work with uh, critics. Yeah, I know they never got a crest finish line. Yeah, and PNZ never moved forward. So, and that's kind of unfortunately been a thing. Is it, I, I've heard it come up. They had a map for it. I know Carl Fleming did a huge ordeal with it. Yep. It never went anywhere. Yep. So I know Abby is on planning and zoning, and she's real focused on it. They've already tried to meet downtown. They're starting to look at things. Um, Fredericksburg is one of the main cities that people are looking at for that reason because they have a very specific type of, of structure they want in place and they want their downtown to look and be inviting and things like that. And they work back with the business owners to be able to assist them with keeping those remodels to what they're asking. Okay, so, now another question for those who haven't heard of it, what is it 312 and how's that different from a 380? That one I'm gonna have to look up because I have not heard I don't That's okay. Look it up. 381 is county. Same thing as a 380 for a yeah. city, but a county. Oh, okay. So 381 is county. And I would think that the new law firm or whoever gets hired in that regard would be a no, no, great no. resource. Yeah, a 312 uh, deals with Texas public policy. Uh, it's a tax payment as well. It's a local government agreement between taxpayer and tax and exempts all or parts of an increase in the value of the real property or tangible property for taxation for a period not to exceed 10 years. So that says it goes up 
you can then abate that to allow them to reinvest. So rather than tax them, you can say, oh, let's see your property went up half a million bucks. We're going to keep your property tax rate exactly the same. Okay. And you, but if you invest that back into your business. And that's where you want someone to be able to monitor that. You yes, want the it. documentation to show that they're actually reinvesting and yeah. not just collecting, you know, right. that extra. So that would have to be a city employee or would it fall to an economic development board? Someone has to manage it. We have to figure out it. Yeah, it, it, it could be either. Doesn't matter. It's, it's one of the city decides. Yeah. And I would think that it's a, could be a opportune time for it because of, you know, our suppressed values on commercial properties with that, that an actual tax payment could be a big deal for them. Oh, yeah. We're turning that on. Something that could be bad. And, and there are bad. state guidelines and you would just have to go back and some specific policy coordinates to, to cover. We being you. <laughs> I've already started working on it, so <laughs> it is possible. We need uh, Megan to clone herself a couple of times. I can't even handle myself. <laughs> you want more of me? The, um, the, the only thing with the three eighties is, and that is, I want to make sure these are they have to be reported to the state. Yeah. So there is an annual report that has to be filed if we have three eighties and, and where they're at, so that the state collects that debt. Joe's really lucky because he can say none. <laughs> so it would be no. you that would have to send those reports, okay. unless we hired or had someone specific that manage that type of contract down yeah. for somebody. Okay. So the next item of interest, um, of course, was the debt um, and where we are currently at and where we are at with our reserves. So at the end of 2022, um, actually at the end of 2023, um, we roughly have 3 million in debt. Um, then that obviously is between the general fund and the water. Over 2 million of it is tied to the water department and the remaining 600 and something thousand is tied to uh, the general fund, the INS. And so that's the debt transparency form. This is what was provided to council. Um, this is actually online as well. We are required to report our debt annually right. um, and the state does keep up with it. So that can show you exactly we have three left at the end of next year, we'll only have two. We'll have paid off the third one. The positive side to that is in our reserves at the end of the second quarter, which was the end of March, we had 3.8 million set aside. Well, three three million eight hundred and seventy seven thousand one hundred forty seven dollars and seventy cents. That wasn't attached to anything else. So these are all reserved account for specific projects. Okay. So the street portion, which lists two hundred and eighty nine thousand thirty five dollars and twenty cents, that is tied to this year's budget for street improvements. That's what it was dedicated to with street improvements. So that's what has been added. Um, we do have the ARPA funds that have to be specifically used for infrastructure, and we've allocated that towards the wastewater stream. Um, then we've allocated to the airport, to tourism. Um, we've allocated funds for the generators for that FEMA grant. Um, we've allocated funds specifically for um, the, the holiday in lift station to re-figure out how to do that one. Yeah. Um, we've allocated funds specifically to Pueblo Nuevo, which is included in this as well. That's for our matching portion of that grant. So these all have specific purposes. There is a small amount of money that is allocated for infrastructure for water and wastewater. Infrastructure, but not a specific project in the infrastructure. How much was that? So at the end of March, it was 796500 so that's how much we have. That is kind of okay. it's for infrastructure specifically for water and wastewater. Something grace or something like Which that. We, yes, yeah. those are, that's your emergency. The 1.3 million, we allocated half of it automatically to the wastewater um, for that project specific. Um, the second half would be allocated as well if we go into another phase of repairs like the clarifiers. Um, the general fund. 
because of our collateral limits, we moved money into the reserve so that we didn't get in trouble with our auditors right. in the state of Texas. Um, so there is money in the text our account that is uh, 500,000 specifically from our general fund checking account so that we wouldn't go above those collateral limits. Right. And so that's not dedicated to any project, but from a cash purpose, I had to move it out. Okay. And I wanted to make sure that council knew that we did not get the grant. Yeah. Did y'all see that? Okay. You don't know why. Megan, you just went through a whole bunch of numbers. Okay. And it, it'd be nice to see what that looks like. Because as I think about budget, you got revenue, you got fund balances, you got budget, okay, uh, in terms of what you have going forward and part of the fund balance in terms of what's being expended. And then your best at a year on forecast, and we're only six months into it. Because I was trying to do some extrapolations about well fixed land. To me, that's all part of the mix that goes into this pot. So that would be the last thing that got sent out today. And okay. that's what you guys actually have copies of. But it, oh, doesn't okay. have it doesn't forecast. forecast. Our software doesn't forecast. It has to be done manually. Um, and unfortunately, when I tried to extract from PDF to Excel, it would have I did it all by hand. Um, and that's where the, it becomes time consuming. I'd hope to cut and paste. Okay, but you're, you're not there. And that's, at what point do you think you'll have a reasonable forecast for your end? Um, I'd like a basic couple of weeks to use. I'm not, I'm not fussed in that, Cal, in terms of timing. It's one of those things to march through. Because when we looked at last year's budget, it showed revenue of $15.4 million in the forecast for this year, you know, 14, or this next year, 14.8. I'm trying to reconcile how close you think you're going to come to the 15.4. And then as we think about this next year, what's it look like relative? Okay. Um, so the next one is the, what we call the budget worksheets. And that's what was made available to the public. And I'm just going to all right, I was going to ask you real quick just to because I'm playing catch up. We have three bonds in debt. Uh, can you just kind of go over real quickly what those were 2005, 2011, and then that other one, the GEO reference bond? I see that they were water refunding and public improvements, just so I can catch up on what those were. So the bonds that are in question. The 2005 um, was for the South Side improvements. Um, that was the new water lines that were put in on the south side. The 2011 CO was the animal shelter. Um, it was like 13 projects. It was, a, it was a combination of multiples. And then the geo refunding was a combination of all of the old debt plus an additional amount um, for like the quiet zone, the once again, a list of projects that some are dependent on. A no. lot of them pertain to water improvements and into the wastewater. Wow. And that last one. And I can get you those specific. I have a separate file that has all those. That's perfect. I'm, I was just wondering about the history of what we spent money on. So historically, the city would refund or borrow money every three to five years. So they would combine what they could call back um, into another bond itself. Um, refinancing, trying to get a lower interest rate, and then they may or may not add a project or two to it, um, or they would go out. I know that the 2011 specifically, because that's the one that everyone was very upset about, had, I believe, 13 to 17, I think 13 actionable items. Um, that was the animal shelter. That was improvements to the old city hall. That was improvements to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, that was supposed to be a quiet zone. Um, that's the one you hear everyone talking about. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, they only completed about two or three of the projects, and the rest just went into operation. Thank you. Yeah. This post office ground lease that annually, or monthly? which figure are you looking at? Well. Seventy-five hundred. What was the question, Karen? I didn't hear it. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, seventy-five hundred. Okay, let me. Host. We own the land. 
Oh, office. post office brown lease. Yeah. So oh. they're they're paying us this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. We own the land. Yeah. Someone else built the building. Yeah. That's a lease that the city gets. That makes it better coming through. Yeah. So everything that you have in so these aren't expenses. This is all um over time we've kind of tried to break it out a little bit to be more specific. So non-departmental um is pretty much like our sale of property, our auctions. Um workman comp used to be in here, but we actually tried to break it down per department. And the reason why I want to explain workman comp, because you'll see some of it in some of our departments, the city pays 100% of an employee's salary while they're on workman's comp. Um, we get reimbursed from workman's comp itself for about 70% of that. And so we deposit it back in, um, but we're, we're paying 100% as long as it's a, an eligible workman's comp plan. Um, but I kind of wanted to explain how it's set up. So the first column is actual experience for 21. So that would be fiscal year 2020, 2021. The second one is actual experience for fiscal year 21, 22. Then we have the original budget for 23 and any amendments we make. Amendments can be made by both internal and request of council. Department heads are allowed to move within their departments um, up to $5,000. City manager of off and director of finance authorizes above that. Anything that hits salaries um, and overtime has to be amended by ordinance with count. And that's in our charter. Um, so the original budget and the amended budget will sometimes not match because we've, we've moved money around. Now the actual experience for the year of 2023, that is until March. So we do it until halfway through the year to give you a 50% look. Last year at the beginning of July, I switched that to June to a nine month so that you had a longer look at what was what was actually being brought in. We're not through June yet, so I can't do that because the information would be half right. Um, so this is as of March, and this shows you um, pretty much everything that had been brought in. Um, we did have an auction in June. Not a single item from the city was actually in the auction. It was all PD abandoned and impounded vehicles. Um, so you won't see any reflection of income there. Um, we thought we would have items from the city to auction, um, but we did not. Um, some of the big things that you'll start seeing changes with um, this year, um, we are required to follow Gatsby 87, which deals with our leased equipment. That is our Xerox machines. That is our vehicle fleet. Um, that may or may not be our landfill. Um, anything that we lease and have a contract that has kind of a, a start in maturity all has to be recorded. So you'll start seeing like other financing sources, um, fixed, fair, it, it's all in here now. Um, that's one reason why audits take a little bit longer. This is a huge impact on our our system here. Um, so we have to start recording all of that as well. So, so but I, didn't, and I get there's more work to be done because now you got to be recording and all that. What does it mean to us as a city? So as from a city perspective, you're going to start seeing really the benefits and and are the income and outcome of having these equipment. Okay, so it's it's an accrual they're doing to make sure you have the proper capital evaluation with depreciation Correct. and the lease income. Yes. I got it. Okay. Um, so the first part is kind of what we used to have as a catch-all. Almost everything was listed as non-departmental. Over the years, we've broken it down. Um, very interesting is to pay attention to interest reserve accounts. This is your Techstar and your Texas class. Um, you'll see where we budgeted, you know, 2,500, 1,000. Um, Techstar has brought in 39,000 in interest. So the more money we have in these accounts, the more interest we're going to collect. So it's understanding is if we're going to pull some of this money out to complete projects, we can't budget high for those um, because we won't collect the interest. Excuse me. What's the so that was initially one of the projects that was money put aside for the walkway through the creek. We got from. Yeah. So that money's actually been reallocated to a splash pack. 
and to the, um, <laughs> doesn't mean it's happening, but it was done. Um, and then money allocated to the generators. Yeah, we got to tell these people we're in the desert. Want a couple of grass or you want a couple of grass? Yeah. Quick question. So if we looked at 21-22 on that and like Techstar was 8,008 bucks compared to 40,000 this year. Is that you were talking about? These are the extremely liquid accounts where we can put money in and, and take it out, you know, after leisure. Why is there that dramatic difference? Were we not in interest rates? Oh, well, right. right. yeah. Interest like, rates only went up, but we also deposited 1.3 million from ARP funds yeah. into it and 500,000 from our checking so we wouldn't get collateral. So the balances themselves change significantly. And then on top of that, the increased right. interest, it just perfect timing. That makes sense. But, but it's the minimalist in a fifteen million dollar budget. It is, but most of it comes from sales tax and property tax. Um, the next category is administrative. Um, you will notice that the admin and enterprise fees are not actually in here. Um, they had not taken place yet as of March. Um, unfortunately, new staff, new turnover, new changes. Um, it just hadn't been done. So, can you remind us what those two buckets are? So the franchise fee is 5% of what is collected from our water, our wastewater, of the revenue, 5% of their revenue, water, wastewater, sanitation, and gas. So every month after we get our total collected, we take 5% and we move it into the general fund. Um, it is an allowable fee by the state. Um, basically, they're paying us to have a franchise here to manage. Administrative fee is 8% of the budgeted expenses without the debt. So if like the water department has 300,000 in debt, we're not charging an administrative fee against that. Um, so it'd be the water department, it would be the sanitation, it would be sewer, it would be airport, it would be gas. And then hot funds, actually, it's considered what we call a 7% overhead um, that they get charged based off of what they bring in. Um, so the administrative fee covers the general fund because the general fund manages all of these departments as far as um, you have the city manager, you have the finance department, all of their pay bill paying, um, all of their record keeping, their asset keeping, that's all managed by the general fund. So you have an 8% percent g and fee. That makes it part of this. We have a five percent fee for the businesses that are businesses in the state. Correct. Um, some of the other fees that are in here, you'll notice, of course, the general fund checking account. Um, the interest rate for that one. Um, the two new ones, of course, are the leases. Um, that we do have to record those differently now. Um, well, and I'm sorry, for interrupting. Why do we charge a different fee for an admin and then for the city services and then the hot funds? Is that seven percent or five percent, nine percent? That's state regulated. So the state defines them. The state said we can define our seven percent. No, but what about the eight percent? No, we don't do eight percent on top of the seven. No, but I'm talking about the enterprise admin fee is eight percent. Who says that? Council said that. Okay, and the water, wastewater, septic, or sewer, and gas. Who says that? For the franchise? Yes. The council. Okay. Okay. So we're setting the GNA rates. Yes. Okay. And hot is set by the state. Yes. Okay. okay. And you're more than welcome to change. No, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm trying to get educated on how those get set, trying to understand what levers we as council have pull. So the next section is the municipal court. Um, so this one actually has another side of it, which is the liability side. The liability side is a, a revenue. It's what we owe the state. So when the court collects their fines and fees, um, we are required to pay the state a percentage of what's collected. So that's a liability. It's not our money. We don't report it as revenue. Um, so you'll notice that we budgeted 50000 for this fiscal year, and we're already halfway through. Um, so we're in track of, of the collections there. So when we have overages or shortages within a department, this is where it gets recorded. So this would be a collection through the whole year. So this is up through March also? 
Yes. So we were at 25 in March. So the fines and fees revenue is from tickets to the place of written and code enforcement? Yes. Um, and code enforcement. Code yes. And ACL. And some buildings are. Girls, or until say like three months, girls 465 traffic stops. And when you go to the court docket, it's only two days. Or well, they dismissed. Not all of well, not all of them are, are being dismissed. Not all of them make it to court because they'll just come in and pay. Okay. Yeah. So they only really go to the court docket if one, they haven't reached an agreement, they don't want to pay it, or two, they want to argue it. Um, but for the most part, people who get like a speeding ticket will just go online and pay. Or they'll take defensive driving and then they just have to, you know, pay the dismissal. So they never make it to the court docket. Um, the police department, um, it has very minimal income. They really, they're not designed to pay money. Um, the LEOS, which is you'll see state comptroller, um, that one is specific to the police department and can only be used by the police department. Um, we put it in their budget. They get money from the state every year, specifically for training. So every year I want them to exceed what's budgeted for training because these funds cover. Thank you. Question. What happened to the money that the city received and the money that was confiscated? So we just received that last year and it was a little over $9,000. And that's due? That went to the general fund. So we did try to track down and work with them, um, specifically where we had to record it, because we originally recorded as part of Ed Bed and they told us not. That, that restitution number then for 2022? No. So during this year's audit and working with the other reports that I'm required to file, um, that's when we learned that the money was put in the wrong and it had to go back to the county. So I was under the impression that it had to stay with Well, I can reach back out, but no one could confirm. I just know we had it in the wrong. I but think it has to go. Yes, because that one got us in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> we we secured it as a, 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 a basically kind of like a federal deposit, and we were told. And um, the fire department, I've been working and with Greg on this one. Um, they will get basically a, a an annual request for payment. Um, that way, they can just cut the check. This one will not be in the budget next year. Oh. What is the, is the county ahead or behind in their payments? Behind. How far? Four, four quarters. A year behind. Ballpark number. We have any idea what they owe? No more than probably fifteen. So can we withhold payments to them now that we yeah. don't have any payments? No, we have to to the fire department not till next fiscal year. So so all. It's not the county's fault. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's county fault. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, but I thought the county paid about half the fire department. No. No, it was less, right? This is, yeah, it's, a, it's significantly less. The county pays for the county fire calls, yep. and then they pay the FEMA rates for the equipment used, and then they pay a portion of the time for the people who get called out. Okay. So it's basically going through and taking every call sheet and then putting it into a separate spreadsheet that tells me, you yep. know, rush truck one at. And then okay. So this is a money loser. Oh, it's a money and time loser. However, it's a, in my opinion, it's about to get worse for the city because with the agreement we have with the county, if the six people are going to manage it, you know, what did we put in? The agreement $40,000. I will not be surprised if that number doesn't go to $150,000 for the city. Well, so we currently have budgeted $77,000. So we're only, we're going to obviously reduce that to the $40,000. Yeah. Um, but we did add to the contract that it has to be one, one we can budget and one that the city agrees on. I understand all that. I'm just kind of thinking through how this is going to go. So if the city's portion becomes 150000 then the county's portion becomes $150,000. I know. Not more than that. Exactly. Yeah. 
I just, I'm just thinking about what's going on down south. So down south doesn't affect this. There are an ESD. So where's the dividing line? Um, what's the mountain that every Christmas mountain? Is that? That'd be that one. It's right where Border Patrol. Little past Border. It's the road. Yeah, so it's really just the north part of Brewster County. Everything that that ESD covers is not part of that. Conference. Right. So, okay, so it'll be an interesting discussion when we get into this about what's being paid down south, what's being paid down. I'm just, my antennas go up. Certainly, I think it's the right thing to go do. We're going to let the board go do its thing, but we're going to want to sit with them sooner than later as they start scoping it out because they're going to want to do this, this, this. They're going to find all the deficiencies. They're going to want the money to support you. They are definitely finding all the deficiencies. Of course. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. They had their first meeting last week. Okay. Are we getting cooperation from the fire department? No. God. Yeah. Well, that would be the next thing they're going to do. March. And I was told that the city was working with the fire department to buy a new ladder. I was aware that. I rest my case. <laughs> no one was aware they were a I rest my case. Yep. Okay. Um, so then add valorum taxes. Um, you'll notice that we budget just the current tax collection, but we do break it down more specifically. Um, when the taxes are collected, there is a difference between what is current and what is considered delinquent. Remember, tax bills are due specific time periods. After that, they do become delinquent. Um, so then we break it all down. We have budgeted 1,992,874. We're at 1,706,000 um, at the end of March. We collect taxes all the way up until September 30th. Uh, building services. Um, this is all of your permits, your plumbing permits, your building permits, electrical permits. Um, this was as of March. Um, we do see trends with the building services. Um, the colder months, obviously, you don't have as much construction going on. Um, and then the permitting process starts to really pick up in pretty much from February to September. And um, when everyone I think is out for vacation, they have time to work on their houses. Um, one of the things that I have asked for Drew to work on this upcoming year is a huge public um, education program um, and getting as much information out there so that they understand that there are certain things that they are required to have permits for. Um, we even have our own staff who's not aware of it. Uh, so getting that information out there will help. Animal control. Um, Jennifer does a wonderful job um, with keeping track of her revenue and making sure to get all of her you know, deposits in. Um, I do want to point out that with the pet adoptions, um, it is set by resolution. But every now and then we do allow for a half price, especially when you know, it's national tax like that or when they need to clear the shelter because it had to. Um, parks and pools, um, very minimal when it comes to income. Um, the majority of it, um, actually all of it, is gonna be your pool and it's gonna be your uh, civic center. Does the swimming pool take care of itself pretty much? Or? It balances basically. Um, we'll probably be a little in the red this year with the pool. Um, just because we've had a little bit more overtime um, with the maintenance side of it. Um, this is the first year that we kept it open, not open, but full the whole time. We didn't drain it, which was a wonderful thing uh, because it hits our water system really hard all at once. Um, but also it allowed the system to just keep going and we didn't, we weren't delayed opening. This was probably the first year we actually opened the water. How many thousand gallons? Is it 350,000? Oh. Maybe a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> um, the street one, um, one of the ones that I get dinged on every year is the road repair. So we cross charge the departments for road repair, but we have no formal process and how we allocate that money. Um, they really, when we get audited, are looking for more specifics as in what are you charging per square foot kind of idea. Um, we don't have a formal process, we budget. Um, the reason why we cross charge is because our utilities do turn up our roads and then they have to go back and fix them. Um, so this one, I've been trying to visit with other cities because this isn't something new. Everyone kind of has been doing it. 
to really look at how do we know exactly what it costs so that when we move that money and cut those checks that we have a real allocation. Um, I would love to just move 30, 30, 30 from all the funds and just move it into the general fund. Um, but for the past several years, it's okay, well, what exactly was cut? What exactly was repaired? What exactly, how many hours, what equipment? Um, it's getting more and more specific. So if you're reaching out to other cities, you stay within populated area and not a destination of course, doctor that have all that oil money coming in, that they're getting really good rates for material. This isn't really based on material um, as much as how they're calculating it. If they're looking at number of hours, or if they're looking, because I can get our own cost structure. I can use our invoices. It's the initial formula that they use. So I'm getting different cities to give me a formula that says, some cities have a flat ordinance and we do currently have a, a road cut fee um, that specifically ties it back into putting it back into a certain fund, like a general fund if we wanted to. Um, but they're not calling them road cut, it's an impact fee. Um, and it's impacted the road, they just put that. And impact fees, there's, there's a whole process. I know Councilor Tandy had wanted me to look into it and I discussed it with her. We can't put impact fees in without doing a formal study. Um, and doing so a what study? A formal study. Okay. Um, so that's one that if we wanted to go with the impact fee, and this would be really big for like developers, uh, new houses, and then what it would cost us. I'm asking other cities, do you take like, like, do I need to go with Eddie for a week and say, okay, it took 15 minutes. Did it take two hours? How many guys did it take? Um, how do they do the square footage? What are we cutting? And then use that type of formula for every road cut that they repair. But then it's also going back with him and saying, how many road cuts did you repair? So new road cuts, we have a database for that with our work orders. But if they're repairing stuff because it's old, uh, Murphy Street's a prime example. Every time they have to go back in and, and patch those road cuts, um, that can be calculated in. So it's under those streets. I would say 30. And my street hadn't been paid for 20 years. <laughs> you know, and all they did was just <laughs> they, they they just patch it. Yeah. Um, so it's really coming up with that secure formula. Um, I know that in 2015, we got an estimate of what it would cost to, to patch or to fix a, or pave a block, um, but these aren't blocks that are being paved. And so ideally, it's, you want to be one transparent and you want the public to know that if I'm moving 20,000 from the gas department to cover repairs to the road because of the gas department, but then my work orders only show three road cuts, those are really expensive repairs. Oh. And so it's it's bringing that back to to, to reality and, and putting in a good solid formula. Um, all of our leases, not leases, these are fiber optics. Um, those come under the street department, but it's very minimal. Um, you'll notice the capital improvements. This is this is the portion of the reserves that was allocated for road improvements. So we had budgeted it out of the reserves to cover it if we need it. We don't ever pull from the reserves unless we actually need it. Um, city sales tax, um, you'll notice halfway through, we had already brought in 50% of the budgeted 2 million. Um, we have the electric franchise, telephone, TV franchise, and of course the mixed beverage. So when you see the bars busy, remember <laughs> it brings in money. All right. <laughs> um, do we know, Megan, why the 2022 uh, city sales tax was kept? We got a one time, we didn't argue it. The state can pull it from us if they want, <laughs> but in February of 2022, we got over $400,000. That's my question. She took it and held on and held her breath for a few months. And yeah, then, I'm still <laughs> hoping that they don't come and take it. Yeah. I didn't think it was more. Um, so we did reach out because it was a bit of a shock. Yeah. Um, and I do know from experience, the county got this huge, and then the state came back and took it because it was the wrong deposit. Um, I think I've narrowed it down to the business that hadn't been paying their sales tax. And so they got hit all at once and we profited. So that is all the revenue we currently collect for the general. 
So you'll notice the two biggest things are going to be property tax so, so, so if you were to look at just the number right now, if you're just shy of $3 million, do you expect this is going to be closer to $6 million in terms of our experience for this year? Um, I think we're going to be definitely around five. So 5.8 was the budget. You think it'd be closer to five or closer to six? Oh, closer to six. So my question. So, okay. And when would you be far enough along to have some estimate of what you think 2024 is going to look like? Um, so once I get the Excel spreadsheet, I can start putting the formulas to give me an estimate. Um, I know when I've been looking at the sales tax, um, and I did provide obviously this the sales tax chart to you guys, um, and I'll share it on the screen. We do increase every year. Um, but we had that one unpredicted like 17 percent increase. And so I believe in what I've done, and I think what was done in the past is we estimate about a few. Okay. It's conservative. And um, uh, They were doing the bus bar at Del Rio. They were doing at the time. We had large equipment going all over Cherry Street, Del Rio there by the turn. And after they get through, the streets going up. So my question is, can you do you? You have to enter into a contract with these people from out of town to be conservative, correct? Can you write a codicil in that contract that they have to just pay some flat rate for street repair? That would be an impact. That's what I mean. I think those people should be impacted as well because they're there in the streets with the heavy equipment. That's tick <laughs> <laughs> you know, there I'm talking about us getting we not just uh, so impact fees would address specifically the like that type of construction, okay. the improvements that would have the wear and tear, new developments, new houses. Okay. Um, and it takes a lot into consideration. It's not just the roads, but it's the impact on the utility infrastructure as well, the water, the wastewater, and the fact that they're violating the other. <laughs> yeah. So the impact fee, if we wanted to add that. In the future, we have to first have a formal study. Yes, and you have to have a committee put together to actually like they called it an ad hoc. Every city has done it a little bit differently. Um, there was a big swing with impact fees between 17 and 19. That's when I've noticed a lot of cities now have impact fees. So what would involve a formal study? Do we have to hire somebody? Can it be done in-house? I would rather ask first what all they've done um if it's a utility study is it a road site we may already have pieces of it done that we could group in to, to complete a project or to complete the, the actual full study um it's on my desktop not my laptop um all the research i pulled for sarah okay and so this is required by the state to in order to start charging impact fees there is some state guidance with it not complete That might be something we want to consider, I would think. And I know not everyone likes that word. Impact fee? Developers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because their argument is they're increasing the property values. Right. And therefore, the city benefits from except the cities. What we just walked through is because the state laws we're going up 80 million dollars the city gets no benefit of 80 million dollars there in line that's why i think we have a big educational act they have this property values that impacts tax rate fees go up the net impact of the city is uh your tax property taxes that goes down so, so your tax 
the, the city, the general fund, and, and this is where it's really important that the public and everyone understand, the general fund is very unique and separate yeah. from everything else. Yeah. And so this is this is your, I, I don't want to say a catch-all, but this is this is a lot of your public services. This is this is your police department managing parades. This is, you know, um, your parks. This is a lot of your quality of life things. Um, so the funding is, is a little bit harder and it's more structured. Um, when I mentioned about raising or implementing new fees for services, it's, you know, do we want a, a, a parade fee where we're not denying people having parades, but they put a little bit towards, you know, covering some of the additional costs. That's our police department closing roads and, and that's overtime for most yes. of us. Barricades if needed. Um, this goes back even trickles down into our hot funds. Um, the street department cleans the road before a road is closed. Um, the barricades, the extra police patrol around the area. These are things that the city is doing for free. And cleans the roads after, right? Because right. you yeah, have all the that trash stuff collection. everywhere. And yeah. For your exactly. It's electricity. It's the borrowing of city equipment and city property. Um, those all are positive. The events and, and everything are positive for our community, but they are coming at a cost. It's getting to be more difficult. Overtime does add up. See, the one which I think about it uh, as a business, we have two buckets with the general fund, and then we have what I call all of our other businesses. It used to be we generated a lot more income out of our businesses that was spent on those businesses, and we could roll that in to cover costs of the general fund. And that's why we create. Yes. And so, uh, inflation has had an impact. Uh, the state actions associated with what you can do on property tax rates existed before, and then they capped what you could do. I think it's value for us to sit as a council and think about what's our revenue strategy in running the business because we don't have one right now. And that's, I think, really, and I, I don't mean that in a negative sense, it's just the business model for Alpine has changed over the last decade. And I think it's worthwhile to talk about that in a way that we all agree with, and it's understandable, and then start having some dialogue and discussion. So from a government perception, or I can even say my perception, we operate as a business, but we're not a business. Um, we're not in it to profit. No, no, I, I run well, no, I'm just, for profit. A lot of people want to yeah. say, well, you're just making money. No, we're not for profit. <laughs> we have to come to the point where what extra we're bringing in is actually being properly allocated to what needs to be repaired. And that's yeah. not happening. It, which is always a dilemma right. for a business like this. What's the right amount? There is never enough money for municipal governments. Never. Never. Ever will be. Okay. But lining up about what is reasonable from an inflation standpoint, in terms of the cost that it takes to run the enterprise, and being able to have those discussions about it. that's the discussion in my view we need to have. And, and the more we can talk about that amongst ourselves, I think the better off we are, because then we can have discussions across the enterprise and with people about what's going on. All they know is they're getting hammered with property tax values, so they get clobbered. Uh, they're getting hammered with inflation. Okay? They're getting hammered with, well, those are the two big items. And they're saying, come out, enough's enough. That's a you know, discussion. And we are not in total control. The state has locked us down. There is yes. hugely. Yeah. Most people have no idea. So now you guys know everything in general. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know it's a thing that inflation went down again. Well, inflation just didn't go up as high uh -huh. as it was going. Anticipation was lower than. That's exactly. It's still going up four and a half percent. Still going up four and a half percent. We're at the end. Yeah, maybe. You know, with you saying about educating the community, that's what we're doing. Yeah. You need to find someone that is very fluent in their Spanish yes. to be able oh, no to question. No question. 
Yep. Because they just don't get it. Yep. Well, and it's not and just it's hard to understand. I think the it's English first. It's both sides. Both sides. Both sides. Yeah. There's a lot of people that speak English that don't get it. Yeah. Well, they they see it. It. There's not a lot of people who really care. That's the point right there. They're just going to complain when it has to, it affects them. I mean, just look at the audience right now. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, and I'll just mention the chart that I was working on with Megan that over three years, property taxable property values in Alpine went up twenty percent, and actual revenue from ad valorem taxes went up two percent. Yep. So their values are going up, but their taxes are going up. We're not. We're not. Uh -huh. Okay. So the next one is our enterprise. Um, this is our water, sewer, and sanitation. So this is a separate component, a separate fund, everything's regulated differently. Um, this is kind of divided in the same areas. You have your interest on your reserve account, and then you have your interest off of all of the other accounts, um, which is your customer deposits and then your, your operating checking account. Um, of course, those significantly have increased because interest rates have gone up. And um, of course, what we're holding as balances. We carry a lot in our checking accounts. Um, hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll start moving that out and actually putting it into some investment, um, get a little bit more back. Water revenues, um, it's a very simple structure. Um, it's what we bill monthly. You'll notice that bulk water has changed. We now record bulk water, everything into the water billing. Um, we used to manually send out invoices for bulk water. We now have that through our system. So it's recorded as all water billing. Um, we have, of course, return check fee when we get bounced checks. You have tampering, vacation, the reconnect, disconnect fees, um, road cut fee, uh, your extension fees, your tap fees. Billing adjustment is when we have to adjust a bill, um, whether it be something that was billed incorrectly. These are recorded only outside of our normal billing process. So a lot of people will get a bill and they'll have an adjustment or a credit um, and then they'll just see it on their next bill. These are ones that specifically get recorded that there's not an next bill recorded against. So why would they just No, 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 they're not paying for the billing. Bill. Oh. No, we just record to show. This is money that we're not gonna have come. It was so billed we getting, that we- Are we getting the year's credit? Every month. So we're not estimating the we are not estimating. No, and I like what Andrew does. That was so, he told me the board and all, and talked to me, that is just awesome. We they, still have need or miss reads. Um, there's always going to be human, human error. error. Right. Um, but as soon as someone calls it out, we do a reread, we go out there and we have a discussion um, with the meter readers. They're all assigned routes. We kind of say, hey, what's going on? Um, did we skip it? Did we... Um, not be able to read it? Was there something? So we have meters that there may be something wrong. Um, I am guilty. I opened a meter and there were things inside I was not going to look. <laughs> oh my um, Come on. <laughs> I, I, I went back because I got in trouble. Um, but there's just sometimes you're like, not today, not today. I'm not going to mess with What was it like in. a snake or a black widow? I'm or? not sure what it was, but it was moving in circles. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Frogs, lizards, cockroaches, Those black widows, scorpions, tarantulas. Um, I will forever be grateful for the individuals who come. I am deathly alert. I run, um, came up on a one and I just ran. I ran past the truck. I just kept Bees. running. Yeah. Um, because they, they they do scare me. Bees. Um, oh yeah. They know you're scared. That's why. And they 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 want run with me. So with the water and all of the utilities they have. Um can you elaborate on the budget billing? Because if they missed a payment and you cut them off the budget billing, what makes the city think that now they can pay full price and not the $280 they were paying, paying versus the 400? So when you get removed from budget billing, um, so there are requirements to be on budget billing. And when one of those requirements is skipped or doesn't happen, you do get removed from budget billing. When you get removed for budget billing, you have to now pay what is owed plus your regular monthly bill. So you're not paying the same every month. So what we do is we put you on a payment plan for no more than three to six months, depending on where we're at in the fiscal year. We don't want it to go over till the next fiscal year because um, we want you to, to end in the fiscal year. Um, and then we work with you. Um, we really want them to really just 
get on that budget, not budget, on the payment plan to get caught up and then resume their normal fees. We have a large number of people on budget billing. That's kind of funny. Um, the gas side is definitely something that is needed for budget billing because during the winter, you're higher, the summer, you're lower. On the water side, we have people on budget billing who are paying the minimum no matter what because they don't ever fluctuate. Um, but we really do try to work with the customer. Um, we just, we want them to be on the budget billing, but at the same time, we have to have them adhere to the requirements. Otherwise, then there's no point in having the requirements and we should just put everyone on so Those requirements are? So they, requirements? Um, so these were passed by council. Um, they are required to have the account for 12 months. Um, so they can't day one open an account and be put on budget billing. Um, they have to make all of their payments. Um, within that time period. If they don't make a payment, they are pulled off budget billing. Um, they should never be disconnected and reconnected, obviously, because they're on. I um, can't remember if there's one more. But the two big ones are the length of the, they have to have had the account for 12 months, and then, of course, making all the payments. Darren so had a question. Who needs to revisit that one? <laughs> Quick question on uh, water, then. <clears throat> First, I guess, two questions. The budget billing, is that a feature of the software assist? Yes. Okay, so if we change software, that would be something that could look. Yes. And then a big one I was kind of wondering, previous meeting we spoke at a council meeting and you said we could be pulling in anywhere from 80 to 90% based off misreads or, or when we weren't actually catching every water bill on those things. It's all the water usage. Oh, all the water usage. Is that missed revenue? Because then if I'm looking at 1.9 million here off the year and I pull 20% off that, that's 373,000. But if we're all, for all the water usage that we're missing, is that missed revenue? Yes. So this could be a, uh, this could provide some, some stuff if we could capture it. Yes, if we could capture all of it and get meters put into place, get either smart water meters or something, you would start to see that return. And can swap, smart water meters be put in scalably? Is it a one and done project or can we do like a certain section of the city? And then as we have- We can phase it however we design it. Okay. You could do all commercial first, you could do one block first. Um, in 2017, the city purchased 50 smart meters and put them on 50 different locations to see how they worked. Um, my old house was one that was on a smart meter and it was kind of cool because I would get emails saying, hey, something's going on um, that would tell me that, you know, all of a sudden I had a spike in my usage. Um, so I kind of knew, oh, if you I had a leak. have a leak. Yeah. Like when I'm sitting at work and my email's going off, I'm like, what in the world? It told me there's something that I have to get out. Yeah, they are pretty cool. So, so can you share with us the, what I call the business deal? What it would cost for smart meters? What we expect for so we never went any further than that, Rick. We put the 50 in and I can't, there, we don't have access to that software. We never did any type of analysis on it. It was a... Well, no, but what I hear is we could have a strategy and what they're suggesting we go you know, a certain part of the city to do the smart meters, just like the understanding of business propositions. What's it cost for the capital? Um, I know that when Scott Perry was the utility director, he wanted smart meters and he was told 1.4 million to outfit the city. I don't know if he had the discussion in regards to how it would affect the long term income. Right. So, when was that 1.4 million? That would have been in 2020. Okay. I mean, yeah, 20. Yeah, because I heard the number was like, and what was presented as far as for capital improvement is the one, one more long. And I'm pretty sure it's changed then. Um, I think that if, I think it's a great idea that we do look into this more um, because I would like to start like more on the commercial side, yeah. your big users, yes. and then start to scale it down. I know one component of it that has been discussed a lot, especially with the utilities, is really the age of the meters and knowing what side of town may or may not have the older meters and yep. start there. So we're losing a lot of money with the old meters. Yes, so they don't record everything that goes through. 
So when a customer gets upset because their bill is high and we they want the meter replaced and we notice that it's an older meter, we are more than happy to replace the meter um, because then we're going to yeah. collect. You remember some years back, uh, the electric company or somebody came by and put smart electric meters on all the homes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the same purpose. Did the city pay for that or did? Okay. And they still do that, right? Because my home, I think it has a smart meter. So the smart yeah. meter, the smart meters with the electric, um, one of the big components with that is they can have someone sitting at a desk and turn you off. Yeah. And read your meters. Yes. Yes. Um, so there are different types of smart meters. Um, they're the ones that are cellular that would basically every five minutes, they would be pulling information and putting it into our database. Um, there are the wand reader ones where you just basically drive by yes. or walk by and, and collect the data. Um, there are several groups who would be happy to take our business. Um, I get lovely emails all the time. About them. So. The cellular ones seem to make sense. That way we could allocate our employee resources to, instead of reading meters, actually going and repairing some of these leaks that we have around town that we don't have time to get to because of bigger leaks or because of tap, um, different things, right? Yes and no. Um, cellular is not cheap, um, but it also, and they're doing better, but it's also not as consistent. So when we have those outages, we're kind of dead in the water. Um, when so we you change, recommend the wand? I think we move that direction um, because it's still easier. Even if we just hired a part-time person who wanted to walk the city, or I've seen it now where it's a little thing that sticks out of the bumper of the truck and they literally just drive. I, you, for me, at, at, in my position, I want visibility because if you don't have, my meter was a perfect example. Not a single person ever went by and actually checked my meter because it was a smart meter. They didn't have to. Well, the meter broke and I went months with the same read. <laughs> and it was just like, if someone had actually gone and visibly, you, you'll see the water coming out of a meter box. You'll see, yeah. hey, wait, something doesn't look right. You'll know when someone's tampering. Uh, we pulled a meter and someone attached a radiator hose. To, to continue getting served. That's that. And a $50 fee plus, plus a misdemeanor charge. Yes, hopefully a conviction. Um, but you have the visibility. You want someone out there to verify, to check. Because if you just leave it like we did with those 50, it was it, 17 grand out the window. We don't use any of them. Okay, now is there somebody you can task with looking into this? Because I know your plate's high. I don't know how you. you I definitely can task it with someone. Um, my priority with this department is letting talk right now. Okay. Can we um, look at that? I'm open to attend the TML in is it October or whenever it is. Yes. And that has tons of vendors. I mean, if if anyone from the city or if we're going to that, I think that great to learn. Just don't give them my business card. <laughs> give them oh, yours. <laughs> oh, if you take my thing, it's not a shirt. <laughs> we had a council person who put my business card in every vendor. Oh. Um, so is there an opportunity, you know, we're talking about business cases and doing analysis. There's been any discussion with Solaris about having one of their business students be able to do some of those. So we had reached out. We're trying to get someone to help with you know, just projects in general. There's interest, but no one's actually hacked it out. Okay. I, I'll be with Carlos all day next Thursday. Focus. Hey, Carlos. I mean, we've reached That'd out. Be great. Yeah, we've reached out to the yeah. business department, um, public administration, and okay. that would help. Yeah, um, moving on, sewer. Um, very simple. Uh, of course, it's the monthly sewer billing. The liquid sewage dumping fee. This one is what we charge the septic haulers to actually dump the waste after they've picked it up from like quarter potties and septic tanks. Um, this one, we're not going to see um, probably the same level because we've had to regulate them dumping out there because of our sewer plant. Um, so we're not accepting as much as what we would have probably in the past or what we had thought we would accept. 
Um, so that one will be a little shy. And then of course our sewer tap. They dump it right. So when you're going down the dirt road, they dump it at one of the manholes right before the sewer. Where do they do you know where they go when they can't dump with us? Just curious. Uh, they used to, from just talking to two of the businesses around here, they used to go to Valentine. Wow. Um, Valentine had been starting to regulate theirs as well. Um, and Van Horn actually just reopened. Um, so I mean, nuclear waste and injury, what would they do there? <laughs> <laughs> just throw it all together. Uh, sanitation. Um, so this one, this fiscal year in March um, is when the sanitation rates did change under our new contract. Um, so it's our regular monthly billing. Um, there is a, a, a side to the taxes collected. You'll notice that in this session, it is a revenue, um, but it's also an expense. So when we, all the taxes we collect, we of course report to the state. Um, there's also the landfill um, assurance. This is the required uh, checking account, the interest off of the required account that if we were to close our landfill, this money would cover those expenses. The landfill lease, I know Rick that you um, asked about this one. Um, so we average 106, well, uh, between 110 to 130,000 a year. Um, this will be the second year under the new contract with the changed increase. So we get another 25% instead of, was it 7% last time? Um, so that one is a valuable line item. Yeah, that one from other cities using our landfill? Or That's from anyone who uses the landfill. So as a resident, if you take an item out there, they're going to charge you. We get a percentage of that. $105. Yeah, and, and it was interesting. Um, I know you probably heard because I got it here. For the guy who runs the hotel. He had a sign up there that says, don't yell at me. Uh, the bill fees went up soon. TES jacked up the fees because it comes back to the city, but all those who dumped out there paid. So they balanced it out so that they didn't lose money. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. It's a business. Yep. Um, you'll notice that we also have the interlocal agreement for the county. This is for the sharing of the recycling center. They do pay a percentage of that. Um, the other item, um, we have had this in place um, for a couple of years now is the tire disposal. We're really encouraging people to just dispose of them with us and pay the five dollars. Uh, it's not an expense, um, but they still feel the need to throw them in our dumpsters, and then we get charged. This weekend is the second entire amnesty event. Ah. Oh. So how many dumpsters will be out there for or containers? Um, we take them until we're full. Last time we were full, like within a half a second. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, well, and we had one upset individual, but we don't take commercial. So we're not taking them from businesses. You can't come with a dump truck full and say it's your personal collection. Um, so we only took from business. Some people have cans. I think it's worth it just to get it. So most places will take them. For you. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah, but so we won't take them from like Bill Williams. We wouldn't take yeah, them yeah. from yeah. Out West yeah. because they're this. Yeah. I'm not taking. They've already charged. Yeah, right. Um, the next one is the airport. Um, this is also kind of a very small collection of revenue. Their biggest revenue is going to come from fuel sales. One of the items of discussion was the increase, leave alone, um, and then competitive. Um, when we look at changing how we collect for the fuel, um, we will have to make sure we do this by, I believe, ordinance, um, because it is in our ordinances and how we mark it up. So we currently mark it up for self-serve and for full service. And so it's the price of the fuel that we pay per gallon, plus that markup. And that's the, the revenue that gets collected. Um, the second biggest one, of course, is the ground lease. Um, this is where we have some that are on the consumer price index and some where it's a penny uh, a year that they get raised. 
Um, you'll notice that the text dot ramp, um, this is a 50 50. Um, we were very fortunate um, this past year that they allowed us an additional amount of money. Um, we asked for an amendment to our RAF grant. It's a, we spend 50, we get 50. Um, we utilize this to pay for part of the payment. So that was a, a good deal for us. Um, other than that, besides the interest, this account does not have very many revenue sources. Yeah, the really only revenue source is yeah. Well, and one of the things, and I will pray for this next meeting agenda, but we'll only have to go. I do think we need the dual strategy. So I don't think we have that. Who are we going to charge, and what's the basis for charging? <laughs> Um, I would also like, as we discussed the fuel charges, that any changes we make, that we definitely put a number, or an allocation of a percentage or something that automatically goes into reserves yeah, yeah. for future improvements at the area. I'm all for that. Yeah, but I, but I do think we need an integrated strategy because we're running a business out there. Um, just a flat rate, because what is it, a buck, a buck a gallon? So it's... For self serve, I believe it's a dollar fifteen, and for fuel service, I believe it's like a dollar forty. Yeah, it's twenty five cents more. Yeah. In my opinion, you want the truck to roll? We don't get enough out of two bits extra gallon to ever buy a new fuel truck, ever. And so, in my view, you'd want to be at what your self serve, and then your fuel truck service ought to be, in my view, probably a buck on top of that. Because when that fuel truck dies, you're never going to get another one close. And, and I think we're living as well. So, but no, I definitely, uh, we do need to restructure it. And I just want to make sure that when we do, that it's very clear and documented that part oh, yeah. of it's going into reserve. Yeah, you know, I agree with that. Yeah, so that's just work to do. And, and I know pilots will go nuts over it. My reaction is, hey, pilots, you know, it's, you want to do self service? Self service, it's a big deal. Just pull your plane up and fill it up yourself. Want a fuel truck? Pay for the fuel truck because we are not collecting that. Thing. And we had one city that was going to sell us a fuel truck that I think was like 10 years older than the one we had. <laughs> oh, yeah. And our fuel truck runs at one speed. Slow. It's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. No, I can't get out of first gear. Need a break. <laughs> Y'all can keep going and I can just go. But does anyone want to do? Everybody needs to go. <laughs> yeah. And it just it, it helps your brain. Just fine. We won't do it. Tomorrow. We're going to yeah. send us a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to walk through some of them as well. We can take away uh, the uh, water rates and sewer rates. Yeah. Very
All right, back in session. Sorry. Okay, so we've gone over the airport. We're on hotel occupancy tax. What's my standard? Um, so the hotel occupancy tax, and we've had this discussion for years, is very state regulated. Um, it can only be used for tourism. Um, it is further regulated that we have to use 51%, obviously, for advertising. That is the only town that has to do that. A group of hoteliers many years ago got together and took it before their representatives and got it passed. They felt that the money wasn't being properly allocated. And so they fought to, to get it to go towards advertising um, to help their hotel. Um, so this is where we have started to clean up. Um, we do not budget per um, collector. So we don't budget for each hotel. We don't budget for each STR. Um, that would be near impossible um, because obviously COVID would have skewed that. Um, STRs are not always in operation. Um, one of the, the benefits of owning an STR is if I want to take a month off and go somewhere, I don't have to rent out my room or my house and don't have to report it. Um, so what we do is we allocate for a year. Um, so you'll see the very top, um, it has the hotel occupancy tax. We allocated 650,000 for this fiscal year. Um, the reason why you don't see the actual is because then it breaks down based off of everyone who's paid. And we don't have it. Um, we have up until March. Um, so you'll notice um, we do have the interest accounts, the Texas class account, which is um, our reserve account, the STR permit fees. Um, and then we start going down into all of the hotels. So we are actively working on getting these cleaned up. Um, we do currently have several hotels who have not paid, who have been notified. Um, their time is actually running out. Um, several of them, um, including the Holland and the Maverick, have not paid this year. What recourse is there that the city has if they don't? So um, we can actually send them um, penalty and interest, and that they have to start paying the penalty and interest, and then we can take it to the next measure where we take a lien out on the top. Um, hopefully we never get to that stage. Um, I do believe that they've had some turnover with management in that those two hotels are owned by the same company. Um, and they've had some turnover. So I'm hoping that the notifications and the pleasantries have reminded them that they need to be. On uh, for the revenue that comes into the city here, is that 7% of the stay or how much? Yes. So it's our, our portion is 7%. And then what does the state get a portion of that out as well? Yes. Over? So I believe the state portion is six percent. Okay. So they actually so the this isn't what the hotels are paying us. This is what they charge in addition to their nightly rates. So this is money that they're collecting from the travelers. This isn't an out-of-pocket expense for them. This is something they collect and report back to us. Um, so you'll notice that we have our bigger hotels at the top, um, and then we start going down into a lot of our B&Bs and our STRs. You'll notice several of these are zero. This is where we started to clean up. Um, before we actually inactivate an account, we like to do our due diligence to make sure that there's absolutely no reason to keep them. Not that we can't put them back in, but from a budget perspective, if I want the actuals to actually print out, they have to be an active account. So you get to see them. Um, the, another reason for that being important is you can see the ones who have been active who aren't active. Um, this tells me that I need to send out letters to individuals. This is how we started collecting, not only based off of the spreadsheet that um, Gio and, and his team has put together, um, but we look at it from a financial with, okay, if you reported last year and you reported the year before, you're gonna get a letter this year saying, hey, friendly reminder. Um, this is also where we can come in and make sure that they've registered, renewed their permit. If they didn't renew their permit, we can inactivate them. Um, but for budgeting perspective, you have to kind of have them in the system for you to see. So the ones that have zero this year, but that had money last year and the year before, you wouldn't see that unless we kept them as an active account. Mm. Um, but you'll see that we had one, 
Now this is the second and the third page. So this is another thing that we've been working on. Every STR is registered as a separate income account with the city. So if I have five STRs, instead of me registering myself as Megan's STR club, um, you're gonna have Megan one, Megan two, Megan three, Megan four, or the, the tricky names that they come up with. Um, they do pay by lodging area instead of by a group. Um, we're slowly trying to get this cleaned up where instead of me having five checks for five properties that I can be reported as one with all five. But we also have to make sure that we set this up clearly because they do have to register all five um, with the permitting process. So it's a little work in process, but we're, we're definitely working it out. You'll notice that this year alone, um, we've added several new businesses. Um, and then you'll notice from 21 to 22 and then to 23, how we've increased the number of STRs that are being registered. Um, and there's a lot. Um, we try our best to keep up with all of the payments um, and send out the notifications um, just to remind them. STRs are a little bit trickier. Um, the state does allow for monthly and quarterly payments. Um, it really is dependent on how much they bring in because we don't have easy access to their financial records. Um, really, they should be paying quarterly because they don't bring in you know, thousands of dollars. Um, all of your bigger hotels are paying. So uh, how do we handle or do we, I look at Danica Investments, that property sold. Is there a mechanism to make sure we collect if the property turns over? So yes and no. Um, we are a very fortunate to be a small community. And so when things get sold or ownerships change, we are aware of it and we send out those friendly letters. A lot of people are very honest and they'll call us and be like, hey, I really didn't know. I got this letter. Um, what do I need to do? Um, the bigger properties like you're talking about, um, we've been keeping track. So these that are zeros all the way across. Those will become inactive in our software. That means that at some point in time they were paying, but they've either gone out of business, they're not operating anymore, um, but we're double checking everything. The letter we initially sent out went to everyone with a zero. Even ended, the end, letter ended, if you're no longer in business, just let us know. Right. Um, and for some of them, it could be that they're still in business and they've been trying to operate under the radar. Right. Yeah. Um, the other way to check a lot of these, um, it's not as user-friendly as it used to be. Um, the state website allowed you to go in and actually pull up all of those pains. Now you actually have to formally request it as an open records request from them. And then they give you every um, one that's paid. Um, in the past, I would do that. I had the, I really had the time, guys. Um, I would sit down and I would actually send a letter specifically saying, you owe us $4,295.52. Now, because of all those additional steps that the state has put into place, collecting it takes me a little bit longer. Um, so now I'm just telling them we need to pay. But usually we can catch them that if they're paying the state, they should be paying us. Um, the only ETJ would be county. So if there's an STR in the ETJ or a hotel in the ETJ, um, they would go to the county. And we've had a few of those happen. So you're getting roughly $65,000 per year for STRs. Who manages all this stuff for you? Uh, Geo is one of them. Um, Heather's been, Yaden has been helping out lately to go through and, and get the information as well. And then our code enforcement, or no, building oh, services, um, help with some of them. So it's a team member. I get the permit because I'm just talking about the collection and getting accounts, make sure. So I've been the one who's been notifying. Yeah, $65,000 is a healthy job. Yeah, they see me at the restaurant and walk away. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of staycationing in Alpine. There you go. <laughs> Megan, on uh, that for, I see that we were expecting 650000 If we're halfway through the year and we're at two twenty five. So the trend for HOT is very unique because March payments, quarterly payments, wouldn't have been paid till April. Um, so a chunk of the spring time period, we don't receive till April. 
Um, and then a lot of their revenue is going to come in between March and September. Yep. And so you won't see a lot of that. Okay. Um, you'll notice the prior two years, 745000 777000 um, Chris and I have a love-hate relationship, Chris Ruggio, um, because once we get close to the end of the year, I'm telling him, you have to spend money, go, go advertise, um, because we don't know the full impact till towards the end of the year. Because of the 51%? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we actually have come up with, I won't say we, Chris Ruggio has put together a marketing plan um for this year and last year that we've been looking at so that we have a broader scope of all of the big marketing uh, strategies we want to do so we can start implementing them at the beginning of a fiscal year and not waiting till we spend the money um, they have a healthy reserve account um, that allows us to go over if needed i think it's important that we do use that reserve account because we just don't want because it is such a restricted fund you don't want to continue to build a reserve because you're never going to be able to use it for anything but. Can tourism. HOT be invested in the Techstar? Or? They do have some in Techstar already, or Texas class. So they use it for advertising and to get some of these big, big marketing plans, it, it's wonderful. The gas department um, has been very fortunate. They have zero debt tied to them. Um, the benefit of having zero debt is the city has been allowed to do equity transfers. Um, we cannot do that with the water department. Um, we can't actually touch any of their revenue um, or net position because of the debt. We have to always ensure we can cover it. Um, currently, we have it broken down by Alpine and Fort Davis. Um, so you'll see the fee split between all the different revenue sources. Um, it's the actual sale of the gas, it's the service fees, it's the tap fees, extensions. Um, those are all broken out separately so that we can show um, at any given point what Fort Davis and what Alpine does. Um, I think that's really important to know, um, especially when we look at this, the system as a whole. The other side of this is, of course, the sales tax that are collected. Remember that it's not only an income or revenue, it's also an expense. So we don't, it kind of washes itself out. Um, and then it has a lot of the little fees as far as the capital, I'm sorry, um, auction, vacation, road cut, miscellaneous. Their interest, you'll notice, um, this year has brought in $20, $25,000. Um, huge jumps. We currently do not have any type of reserve account for the gas department. Um, it is all sitting in a operating checking account at West Texas National Bank. Um, we do have a finance policy that says we should start putting money aside. It will be one of my recommendations and procedures through next fiscal year that we actually take a chunk of their money and, and set it aside for the gas department for when we have that unexplained event, um, the rectifier. You know, having the money and we're not putting it into operating, we can pull it out of that reserve and just pay for it. What do they auction? So they have, of course, their own assets, vehicles, oh, okay. um, some office equipment. Um, vehicles are our biggest option. Okay. Um, uh, last fiscal year, we did a, a clean out. Um, council had approved, and we auctioned off like 40 something vehicles. Um, some of them had just been sitting there, they weren't usable, uh -huh. kind of cleaned house. This is a bit of a tidbit back on the hot funds. Right now, the requests are well over a million dollars for this picture. Oh. Um, so there won't be any problem. It'll be an allocation discussion. I, I am going to put this out there and anyone listening, um, I am going to attend those meetings. Uh, well, I have been attending. Um, I really want the, the board yep. to make sure they are following all of the procedures. You and me both. That's why I'm going to be sitting there too. So if you're doing the reporting back that they're supposed to. Not only the reporting, but providing the proper documentation. I'm all for providing support for our community, but at the same time, there's a level of accountability. Yep. And so for me to justify and feel comfortable when I report to the state that this is what the money is going to, the documentation has to be there. That would be um, I also really want the, the, the community and the events to understand the impact of the in-kind that the city provides. Yep. It's not just the hot funds we provide. And so I think they take the city for granted in some cases, 
that, well, you know, you have the money, you should let us have it, but there's always more to it. And Chris Ruggia has been probably my rock star um, that I don't worry about the hot funds because he ensures that the budget is being maintained. He makes sure that everyone is within their limits and they're spending it on what they should spend it on and he's checking it. Um, and I just wanna make sure we continue. Is it new activities that are coming up or? Yes, new stuff. Yeah, yeah and, and, and unfortunately there's not a quorum at the last meeting. The next meeting is the 20th, Gio? 21st. 21st, yeah. So there's, he'll be there, I'll be there. And I'm making calls to make sure we have quorum and I know Chris is as well. Yes, Chris tried calling and I, they, they really wanted to and I told them no, This is, it was an actual called meeting. It yeah. wasn't a, a workshop where they could just discuss. Yeah. Um, so this next one will be a workshop so that they can at least have the discussion. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of information and, and there's a lot of people requesting. And so what do you do in the event that let's say they request funds from the hotline and they get it and then they don't utilize it but they give it to C. So there cannot be any transfer of monies without going through my office. So Chris and I have that discussion with like, okay this is what they originally re originally requested 10,000 they only used 5,000 but C requested 15,000 and we only gave them 10 we have that additional five do we want to consider utilizing it in most cases we're going to work out an agreement if we can't then it would come before council yeah, council 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 council. Council. no that's I mean because the invoices for billing don't come in until after the fact they come in and then you allocate the money you do the so Chris actually regulates all that yeah. so it would have to be the event coming in with the documentation that supported that event so if someone has done something behind all of our backs then I would definitely let Chris know so that that can be part of the discussion that we don't fund them because that would be misappropriation of them. And I would hate if someone has done that. I mean, that's just. But Chris would take the advertisement to go with the invoices. Yeah, we don't pay for anything until it comes to Chris. What? what? Don't ask questions so we can go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to name it, I'm not sure. <laughs> so another item that was brought to council was the resolution um, that was passed last year. And I will do a screen share for this one. So you if anyone has noticed over the past several years we've started to take the fees and restructure them into a fee structure that's approved annually by resolution um it has worked out very beneficial that we've done it piece by piece instead of trying to do the whole city at once um there are a lot of updates when it comes to our ordinances because they cross some of the, the ordinance chapters so utilities does have multiple chapters besides chapter 98 that lays out those fees. So what was important was that we just get the process started. Um, so what I have up on the screen is the resolution that was passed last year in regards to the fees. You'll notice that the yellow portion is what was changed. Um, so this isn't a clean copy. I wanted to present the the approved version with the edit so that you can see when we do it again this year what's being proposed will be on the actual fee side but i wanted you to have a comparison for this meeting so we actually have increased our fees the past couple of years we have not increased the fee of water the actual cost of the water has not increased it's been what's associated with it the meter charge the sewer tap fee, the water tap fee, um, the reconnect and disconnect, um, the extension fees, that's all been updated. So under the water side, you'll see the extension fee. So what I mean by extension is if I want to attach to the water system and my house is you know, right here for a visual, but the water line is say 50 feet over here, I'm going to pay 30 foot or 30 per foot. To get to that, yeah. So there's an extension fee. So that 
does add up, especially because our city wasn't designed to have those expansion pockets. So for someone to come in, they may be a hundred foot away from a park or they may be even further, um, still within the city limits, by the way. Kind of funny, interesting to see. Um, but it's the same with our sewer. The sewer is a little bit harder because not only do you have the extension, but if we extend past a certain footage, we actually, you have to have manholes put in. So then it becomes even more expensive. Um, you have to have a manhole every so many feet. So you may extend to your property and have to have two manholes put in. Um, and that's an expense. I know we have one project right now that they're requesting for one property. It's not a development. It's literally one like mother-in-law unit um, has to have two manholes put in. And the last estimate we got was over a hundred thousand. Oh my gosh. Because it wouldn't be, our staff wouldn't be able to. Um, with all of this, just for background, all of this also has to ensure that we grade it properly. So I can't just go in, dig a hole and put a pipe, um, especially with our sewer. It is a gravity fed system. So from whatever manhole you're at, you have to be able to grade down or up to get to that property. Um, you can't just lay it in there. Um, so there are some regulations to that. So some of them are at the expense of the homeowner. Um, some are very fortunate when they add new um, structures or they want a new sewer water line, they're right off of one and it doesn't cost them anything extra besides the tap fee. The tap fees were increased um, depending on the size of the line that was being put in. Most of our lines within the city service lines are three quarter inch. Um, so most property owners have a three quarter inch and that went up to 1325. <laughs> And then of course, the larger you get are gonna be more of your commercial businesses and those are gonna be at cost. So it's whatever it's gonna cost us to do. Um, same with the cutoffs, um, not cutoffs, I'm sorry, uh, residential four inch sewer, and that is our most expensive. Um, of course you have the meter and cutoffs, those are all increased. Um, the, Charges for metered accounts, you'll notice residential and commercial. This is the base. This is the six to, these were all increased by $2 for this fiscal year. So this is your base meter charge. Um, this is what starts the account off with. So you would have your $8 base meter charge plus the cost of the water. Um, so the cost of the water for the first 2,000 gallons is $8.57. So your minimum water bill would be sixteen fifty seven a month. So, so these all went in place a year ago. Yeah. This is what we're our revenue is for this year. So every year these would get looked at, um, and the reason why I want um, council and the public to see um, this was approved. We moved forward with it, but when we started the rate study, I wanted you to know that we had them update the rate study to reflect this year's rates um, because they were looking at the ordinance at the time and they were incorrect. So the rate study that was provided to council is just a summary of what we could do to bring in more revenue. And I thought it was really important to include that page that shows you what exactly would be in addition to based off of the number of accounts we had the size of the, the account it was. So if it's a three quarter inch, if it's a one inch, um, a two inch, um, we do have various numbers. Um, if we were to increase the base rate or if we were in, to increase the water side, the usage rate. So our usage rate is a tiered rate. And this is just water, okay guys? So when you think about your water bill, you have to look at it from three sides. The water side, which is what you, your water usage. You're paying for the base meter and then you're paying for the water and the water structure. So for every 2,000 gallons or up to 2,000 gallons, you're going to get charged that 857. But then for the next one to 2,000 gallons, it's $3.37. And then it's $3.35, $3.40. So the more you use, your, your, the structure changes. Um, and this one's really hard for people to understand because they just see a number. Um, but it really is the more you use your structure of, of what you're using is going to change. This is your water. 
your water is not expensive compared to other cities. Okay. Your water bill as a whole is different. Um, the next section um, goes over some of the additional fees that we charge for the utilities. The sewer is one that we really have to look at. Um, we charged, and at the time, it was a great decision and made it very easy for billing. Um, we went from a tiered structure to what water your what your water usage was for the three months in the winter months, which would be your lowest months technically, and then we averaged it out, and that's what you would get charged for your sewer rate. We went to a flat based residential rate, so everyone who is a resident pays a flat sewer fee. Commercial are still on that same structure where the three uh, it's. December, January, February, it's an average of your water usage and that's what determines your sewer rate for the following year. Um, so when we look at it again this year, we really do need to consider some of the options that were provided in that rate study, especially as we start to phase and work on our sewer plant and looking at those fees. Um, the other big rate that we changed was the base fee for the gas department. So it was the rate being provided under contract by WTG times like 1.05% plus a markup. The original markup was $8.50 and we changed it to $10. So it's $10 plus that base. Um, currently, um, the gas has been doing a huge ups and downs with what we're being charged. Um, so the average gas bill has been from $14.35 up to $15.67. And that's kind of the same thing. We bill our customers based off of what we get billed. And so that's why it's really important when I get those bills that I double check in and I follow up and I ask questions because we don't want to go through what we had to happen in the past um, because their rates fluctuate based off of the WAHA. Um, we want to make sure that we stay on top of it. So every month, I know JJ King gets an email from me. Can you explain what WAHA is? I don't remember what the acronym stands for. Um, so it is a company that basically, it's what they're being charged. So whatever West Texas gas is being charged, the markup and all that, and, and the price of gas and the delivery and is what we kind of get charged. I know there's probably a very detailed technical explanation for it. But ultimately, it's whatever the market value is, is how we get charged. As you know, my campaign against acronyms. The Wisconsin Amateur Hockey Association. <laughs> Thank you. So in what you sent us, Megan, there are some proposals relative to water rate increases and sewer rate increases. Those are anywhere between 19 to 46%. So when will we have the discussion about what it cost the water and what our, our water study comes back with? So I had reached out to the committee or the group that did our rate study because I'd like them to present it to you. Yep. I mean, they're, they're experts in the field. Um, I was hoping that tonight, um, but I did not get a response um, and I've asked for the 20th. Okay, so I'm not going to be here on the 20th. Well, I haven't gotten a response in tomorrow for deadline. So, <laughs> um, and then she she understood when I reached out to her because I did explain that I think sometimes it's better to have someone else come in um, to, to fully explain it. So what they've done is they've gone through and basically looked at our budget and what we've spent um, and done the calculations to show if we brought in extra revenue, then we could put it back to to the needs of that. Well, I, and I get all that. That's why I go back to really understanding what our enterprises generate versus what the general fund is, because that's that's the Rubik's Cube we've got to go through. I just don't believe as residents, anyone could accept a 19% increase in a lot of costs. That's the minimum. It's double that 38% and then same on sewer. The minimum increase as part of this is 36%, the maximum 46%. So the biggest increase is on the, be on the sewer side. Um, I'm not proposing a rate increase on the water side, um, only because I want a strategic plan to, what are we gonna use the money for? Yeah, that's, it's, that's 
the sewer side, we know what we need. Mm -hmm. And I don't need it to that level, but I definitely think that we need to start adding, even if it's just another dollar, start taking that money that when we pass the resolution, that that difference is automatically put aside you instead know, of it going into the operating. You don't get an argument out of me. I just don't know any resident who can handle a 36% increase. And that's the lowest one we put on the table. So on the sewer side, the reason they've added the way it's structured higher was to go out for that, that debt, that five point six. Okay, no, that's what I'm all ears just want to understand what is this on face value right now. This is to me is a non starter. We can never sell this. Uh, so we got, we got a lot of work to do. It goes back to the tax strategy. There's no question we have lots of challenges on expenses. I think we as a council and working with you got to figure out what our game plan is and how we will talk about this in a way that people just hop and get it. Right now, like I said earlier, we got hammered with taxes. Uh, in terms of property taxes, and we got to understand what those implications are and how we go in the city. So for me, the big push on utilities will be the sewers. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah. So Megan, real quick, what changes have been made to the water that it doesn't taste as good as it did ten years ago? No changes have been made. If there's a significant taste, a different taste. There's been no changes made. We I think operate. people are just used to going to bottle water and then they come yes. back and it's exactly. got a different chain. A different I mean, we've had people that have lived here, grew up here, went to school here, graduated here, graduated from Saros. They come back for reunions and they're like, oh my God, what happened to the tap water? Well, every it's city's going to have different water. I mean, yeah. like I think Balmeray probably has some of the best water. And I don't live in I've Valmarie. drank bottled water for the last 30 years. So um we only um treat ours with the minimum requirements, which is four. Now, I think calcium content's gone up. That could be it's probably you know, it's coming out of an aquifer. Yeah. So those conditions change. When I can't like on the resident or on the actual customer side, I don't know what you've done with your lines either. Yeah, I don't know true. if you've replaced them. I don't know if you've done something, changed something. Or if you've got copper ones and you're just enjoying a little extra, I <laughs> mean, um, which we're we're learning about all right now in our red right. copper. Um, but as far as the treatment of the water, it has not. We're not allowed to change it without TCQ approval. Yeah, TCQ. <laughs> so this is really just to get you all the information so that you can start kind of just putting your how you want to move forward. Um, we will have a lot more meetings besides the next Saturday one. Um, what so Saturday is that? The 24th. Okay. To start addressing every piece. And we need to because in our town halls, residents gave us a mandate that they want things done. They want the wastewater treatment plant taken care of. They want our fresh water taken care of, the pumps, the wells, things like that. They want the streets taken care of. So we've got to take that into consideration. And but then they, they want the employees. The state, the state jacket prices. That's part of the educational activities. Yeah. So yeah. These are the things we line up, prioritize resources. And but I think you'd be surprised. A lot of the residents in, in surveys and Facebook surveys and in talking to my neighbor, um, Katie Nixon, and in talking to various people have said, do what we need to do to fix Alpine. That's a you're different talking, environment than the you're rest talking, of Alpine. I you're talking to a, Ford one is not even a different close. population than that than most of the people are in. Yeah. The other one is not a matter of not wanting to; it's a matter of not being able to. Yeah. The majority of people in Alpine, I would think, are lower income, medium to low. Well, unfortunately, we're not. We're, we're not no longer qualified. We don't qualify no. anymore. Well, there's no question about that. Go ahead and talk to me. You just look at the demographics. The demographics, you know, people own a house, they're in the, they're in the uh, above 50,000 household income. The renters, they're at 26,000. Those are the ones who are going to get with the water, gas, wastewater. That's where the issues are. And they're going to get hit on the rent side, too. So that's the struggle we got. So that's part of the dialogue we need to have in a way that makes sense. Uh, because getting a mandate is one thing. But they also say, as I think that's a minority, hey, where are we in terms of total cost of the city? That's our job to go think about through that strategy. I almost think we probably need a session to look at one of some of what our strategic options are to think about. Mm -hmm. Just 
Because until we have that, I don't think we have a game plan going forward. Then I can think when we have strategic options, that was my biggest fear. I think one of the strikes of doing the strategic plan was we got input. My biggest fear out of that was uh, were people willing to come up with additional resources to go work in, in a high inflation environment? And that we've not addressed. We've not addressed at all. And they want all that, but yeah, we have everybody that we're giving money to coming up and saying we want more money. Well, that's a municipality, yeah. But it's like you. Yeah. And the other side to a lot of this, and a lot of cities are having to do it and, and talking with other people, the city can say no. Yeah. So we don't say no. Um, we just keep feeding and feeding and feeding, but at what point do we say no? See, I, and as I think about strategy, it's big rocks. What are the big rocks we're going to take care of? The big issues. We know it's water. It's wastewater, it's streets. Those are the big rocks. We know we got to take care of employees, otherwise we can't run the city. That's another big rock. And I almost think about given those big rocks, what's our cost associated with those? What are the things we can now increase enough to be able to get some additional revenue to cover some of the other rocks? Uh, I, I honestly think. Uh, and I was pleased, Megan, you came to the last city council meeting with here's where we are in terms of employee headcount. We got 107 billets, but you got 24 empty. Well, actually, we have less now because four have been hired. Okay, so <laughs> well, but let's say I bet you we got, just four more, but you got 20 empty. There are some opportunities to be able to take care of employees to retain them. Okay, because you're going to go up about 15% of your employee costs. Yes. Okay, and as you go up 15% of the employee cost, out of your 107, you just took out 15 positions you can't afford anymore. So that's kind of the dialogue you look and say, and we're in a different situation than the school district. School district has a different problem. Their uh, student teacher ratio is 10.9 versus state's 13.9. They got different issues trying to work. They got to come down head count in order to survive. When we did budget extra positions this year, based off of supervisors wanting more employees, I understand. But I think now that we have for the turnover has happened, we realized we didn't need those positions. To, to my point, we don't have so you've got some flexibility yes. there. Those are all the dynamics. I think we got to work our way through. How do we go off and work that? And that's the Rubik's cube. Uh, uh, as I think about. You know, so the next meeting is, you said the 24th. And that's on expenses. That's on Saturday on expenses. I think what would be really helpful if maybe at the next city council meeting next Tuesday, we can talk about what are the sorts of things we now need to start talking about from a priority standpoint so we can lay out the rest of the schedule. Because I think we got a busy July and August. Okay. You want to put that as an information discussion? I will. I'll put it on. Yeah, I'll put that on. I, I leave at like six in the morning, so. I know, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'll, so I'll put that on. I'll have that in a minute. Yeah, because I'm, well. I won't make the deadline for anything. So I, I'm leaving at three tomorrow morning because I got to get back to El Paso to catch my flight back to LA. So but you're flying. I'm driving. I, no, I'm, no, I'm driving my bicycle. No, no, I flew in just for this. I flew commercial, drove down three and a half hours, and I drive back three and a half hours tomorrow. Well, it's just an information. Yeah, but I'll put that on. Yeah, I'll let that. But I think that's what we're going to talk about. What is our, and I'll put some thoughts together. We can all look and say, Rick, that sucks or that works. And then we can work our way through it. But I think we got to work the strategy. We got some tough things to go work. But it's the right things to go work. Well, then that's it. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Meeting adjourned. Yeah. <laughs>